When you legislate personal belief, you're in violation of freedom of religion. The Catholic Church may espouse its opinion on abortion to the members of its congregation, but they are in violation of separation of church and straight state when they try to proselytize their abortion politics on people who are not Catholics. That's novelist John Irving in an interview with Mother Jones magazine in 1997. And what he was doing was defending his novel, which was also a, um, a, a hit film, The Cider House Rules. This is Atheism History Week, and I'm John Rafferty, the president of Secular Humanist Society of New York and an active member of New York City Atheists. In this program, each week, we uh, review famous events, birth dates and death dates of people, free thinkers, atheists uh, of all stripes in the United States and around the world, uh, events and people uh, are significant to this week. And this week, of course, is March 1st to March 7th. John Irving was born on March 2nd in 1942 um, in Exeter, New Hampshire. His books include The World According to Garp, which was an enormous bestseller, the Cider House Rules, which I just referred to, and A Widow for One Year, all of which were turned into movies. And uh, the Cider House Rules particularly portrayed a sympathetic abortionist during the era when it was illegal and uh, free-thinking subject matter. Irving told, John Irving told Mother Jones Magazine in 1997, we are a country that likes to be punitive. We want to restrict. It's a kind of religious fervor run amok. As to his religious or irreligious opinions, he was asked by Mother Jones if he was religious, and he said, you know, if you ask me one day, I might say, well, sometimes I feel a little religious. If you ask me another day, I just say flat out, nope. And he, uh, in uh, Brave Souls, writers and artists wrestled with God, love, death, and things that matter by Douglas Todd. Irving was quoted as saying about his views on religion, now, if you push me to the wall, I'd say I'm not a believer. But if it depends on the day you ask. I'm not comfortable calling myself a believer, a Christian. But if somebody says, are you an atheist? I'd back down from that question, too. Nevertheless... I think that Irving's book, uh, The Side House Rules, and certainly the movie made from the book uh, starring Michael Caine uh, in a terrific performance, probably did more to change more people's minds about the subject of abortion than all the arguments, speeches, and debates in Congress and the various state houses around the country. Um, Irving portrayed an abortionist in those days before abortion was legal as a caring soul who tended orphan children, who was a pillar of his community, uh, was a uh, decent, loving, caring man who also did abortions, which, when you think about it, is a decent, loving, and caring act when a woman needs it. That's John Irving, born March 2nd, 1942, and still very much with us. On March 3rd, in England, William Godwin was born in 1756, the son and grandson of straight-laced Calvinist ministers. Strictly raised, in, uh, he became a minister by age 22. But his reading of um, the atheist Dolbach 
and others caused him to lose both his belief in the doctrine of eternal damnation and his ministerial position. He was kicked out. Through further reading, Godwin gradually became godless. He promoted anarchism, uh, and uh, his, uh, he argued for morality without religion uh, in print, which caused a scandal. He followed uh, his book on morality, Political Justice and the Inquirer, Uh, with a trailblazing fictional adventure detective story, Caleb Williams. Uh, introducing readers to ideas in a popular format. Godwin was a leading thinker and author in his day, that is, the late 18th century and very early 19th, uh, and was a friend of and very close to Thomas Paine. Uh, he was uh, enormously influential among his, his famous peers. Godwin was also a member of a much wider group. Member sounds like it was a club. It wasn't, but let, let, me, let me try to sketch it out for you. Uh, he and Mary Wollstonecraft were secretly married in 1797. She was the author of A Vindication of the Rights of Women. And uh, she died tragically after giving birth to their daughter, Mary, also named Mary, in 1797. Uh, after she died, Godwin wrote um, a biography of her called Memoirs of the Author of a Vindication of the Rights of Women, which further scandalized society. Uh, Godwin was caring not only for the baby Mary, but her half-sister Fanny remarried. He and his second wife opened a bookshop for children, and he, out of necessity, became a very well-known author of children's books, well-known in the sense of using a pseudonym, because he was already uh, anathema to most of the British public for his atheism. So little Mary grew up, Little Mary grew up, and at the age of 16, ran off with the poet Percy Shelley, whose middle name I think is pronounced Bish, B-Y-S-S-H-E, -S but I don't know. At any rate, she ran off with Shelley. Now, Shelley himself, a few years before, had run off with another 16-year-old, one Harriet Westerbrook, the daughter of a barkeeper, of a barkeeper. So Shelley's family had disinherited him. Uh, but that marriage broke up, and now Shelley and Mary Wollstonecraft Goodwin um, took off for the continent, traveling for a time with George Gordon, Lord Byron. Um, and the three of them had a writing contest, a race to see who could turn out a novel fastest. And Mary won it. And, uh, well, I think she won it. But the point is that what she turned out has become one of the classics uh, in the English language. Uh, and she wrote it in, in a hurry. Uh, Frankenstein. Now, now, consider Frankenstein for a minute and think about, get past the Hollywood... Um, uh, images of it, and think of, for a moment about the background, the idea behind Frankenstein, which the the uh, subtitle of which was the New Prometheus. The concept is a scientist creates human life. He uses modern technology, modern for early nineteenth century, very early nineteenth century. But he uses technology to resurrect a body. He creates life. This is not something that's going to go down very well with the church elders of any church. Um, so this is basically a novel in support of atheism. Uh, 
Shelley's first wife, that young lady that he first ran off with, uh, committed suicide, and he tried to get uh, custody of his two sons by that marriage, uh, but he was denied custody by the British courts because of his, quote, infidel views, unquote. Uh, Mary and Percy wed eventually in 1816 and had a son, uh, William, and uh, where the, the couple moved to Italy, where Shelley wrote Prometheus Unbound, and um, where he received an invitation from their old friend Byron uh, to sail to Pisa to consult over a new magazine, a free thought magazine. Uh, on a return trip, the um, yacht capsized in a storm and Shelley drowned. Godwin uh, lived on and uh, he lived in poverty most of his life uh, because he could not make any money uh, from his writings under his own name uh, because printers simply wouldn't publish them. And, uh, but nevertheless, in private writings, he continued to attack the Christian religion as he put it to free the mind from slavery. And uh, the genius of Christianity unveiled in a series of essays was published only many years after his death in 1836. But uh, William Godwin, right at the center of a group of free-thinking, free-living atheists in England and on the continent in the early, to the early 19th century. In the late 19th century, in 1871, on March 5th, a fiery anarchist, communist, revolutionary, for the hell of it, Rosa Luxemburg was born in Russian Poland to a middle-class Jewish family. Uh, she was a revolutionary ag agitator uh, by her teens. Uh, she ran away to Zurich in Switzerland to avoid uh, imprisonment by the Tsarist police. And she earned a doctorate at the University of Zurich. And uh, she wrote more than 700 pamphlets, articles, speeches, and books advocating mass strikes by the proletariats. She was in and out of prison, once for advocating during World War I that German soldiers turn their guns upon the government and overthrow it. And in 1919, she and two leaders of the German Communist Party, which Luxembourg helped found, were arrested. Uh, the police knocked her out and threw her in a river. Figured that was the end of her. Nope. She survived. And um, socialism was more her passion than free thought itself. Uh, but um, she wrote, Socialism in the Churches in um, uh, 1905 and strongly believed in freedom of conscience and she sh sought to show that the church, originally considered a refuge for workers, was now clearly oppressing them. Uh, in 1905, the year of the first huge uprising in Tsarist Russia, uh, she wrote, the clergy, no less than the capitalist class, lives on the backs of the people, profits from their degradation and their ignorance and the oppression of the people. Rosa Luxemburg was a communist, no question about it, but she died in 1919 and never saw what happened to her ideal of a workers' revolution and uh, a society of free thought. She worked for a utopian world. She never realized that the dictatorship that would follow the Tsar would be even worse than the Tsar. Um, Rosa Luxemburg, a campaigner for women's rights, for workers' rights, for free thinking, uh, born March 5th, 1871, and died in 1919. On March 7th, in 1849, right here in America, Luther Burbank was born in Massachusetts. 
Uh, Burbank is remembered by people of my generation where we used to be taught the uh, lives of famous Americans like Edison and Carnegie and Ford and George Washington Carver and Burbank. It was all very uplifting uh, instruction that we received in elementary school. And before I found out, before I started investigating, or I should say researching, uh, Luther Burbank's life for this program, I always thought of Luther Burbank as the guy whose most important contribution to society was the uh, invention, what do you call it, the, uh, of the Shasta Daisy. That's what I got from school. Luther Burbank was an atheist, a social uh, agitator, and a one of the most important uh, biologists, or uh, I should say botanists, in America. Uh, he became famous very early when he single-handedly saved the U.S. potato crop from, the deadly blight, from a deadly blight by cultivating russet potatoes. Uh, he cultivated russet potatoes and these survived the blight. Uh, he had, he um, was an inventor. He created Burbank's experimental farms in Santa Rosa, California. And the Shasta Daisy was just one of the 800 new varieties of fruits and plants that he created. Uh, Act of Congress actually uh, recognized him for his uh, plant uh, breeding, and Robert Ingersoll, the great agnostic, the most popular speaker of the late 19th century, and a definitely an atheist, was one of Burbank's greatest fans. However, Burbank was shaken by the Scopes trial in the 20s. He couldn't believe that American people, America could be that dumb uh, to not understand the scientific fact of evolution. Children are the greatest sufferers from outgrown theologies, he wrote. And after the Scopes trial, and to think of this great country in danger of being dominated by people ignorant enough to take a few ancient Babylonian legends as the canons of modern culture. Our scientific men are paying for their failure to speak out earlier. There is no use now talking evolution to these people. Their ears are stuffed with Genesis. And in 1926, he was interviewed by the San Francisco Bulletin. Remember, Burbank was one of the most revered people in America at the time. This man who had created a botanical revolution in America, who had created uh, over 800 new varieties of fruits and vegetables of various kinds. And he was asked about his free-thinking opinions, and he said very simply, I am an infidel. Guess what the headline in the San Francisco Bulletin was and in a lot of other papers around the country and around the world. It created actual shockwaves. People were stunned that their hero, Burbank, didn't believe in God. Uh, he was inundated, uh, the Freedom from Religion Foundation research tells us, inundated with letters, which you could expect. What you could not expect was that he felt that he had to answer them each personally. And he sat down and he started writing to thousands of people, individual letters to thousands of people. He worked like crazy at it and uh, countless hours at it. And his friends thought that this was what led directly to his death from exhaustion in 1926. His friend and biographer Wilbert Hale wrote, he died not a martyr to truth, but a victim of the fatuity of blasting dogged falsehood. Nevertheless, a crowd estimated at 100,000 came to Luther's memorial and heard 
an openly atheistic and ringing tribute by uh, uh, Judge Lindsay of Denver, Colorado. And California, the state of California, still celebrates Luther Barabank's birthday as Arbor Day, planting trees in his memory every year. He died in 1926. Luther Burbank, botanist, revolutionary, atheist. This has been another edition of the Atheist His the, the Week in Atheist History, and I'm John Rafferty, and I'm glad you were able to be here with us. We'll be back next week at the same time to discuss the events and the people in history, the history of atheism and free thought of uh, next week's calendar. I uh, hope to see you or have you see me uh, next week at this time. Thanks for watching. Wherever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation, at least not just. We are also a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, and a Buddhist nation, and a Hindu nation, and a nation of non-believers. And finally, new rule, just because the Constitution doesn't have a religious test for office, doesn't mean I can't. This past Monday was Constitution Day in the U.S., and while I was going over the Constitution with my two adopted kids, <clears throat> Zach Ono and Mogadishu, <laughs> I'm homeschooling them. <laughs> I was struck again by Article 6, Section 3. It says, no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office. And I agree. No one should ever be disqualified for their religion, even the funny one, <laughs> like all of them. <laughs> but the problem is that there is a religious test in this country. According to a recent poll, 7 in 10 say it's important to have a president with strong religious beliefs. The other three couldn't take the poll because it was Friday night and Yahweh wouldn't let them answer the phone. <laughs> but fair is fair. So for myself and the other 15 to 20 percent of Americans who the majority call non-believers, but who I call rationalists, <laughs> here is our religious test for office. If you believe in Judgment Day, I have to seriously question your judgment. <laughs> if you believe you're in a long-term relationship with an all-powerful space daddy <laughs> who will, after you die, party with your ghost forever, <laughs> you can't have my vote even for Miss Hawaiian Tropic. <laughs> I can't trust you at the levers of government because there's an electrical fire going on in your head. Maybe a president who didn't believe our soldiers were going to heaven might be a little less willing to get them killed. Yeah. <laughs> Candidate Mitt Romney, a Mormon, believes in spiritually blessed underwear that can protect him. He seemed like a nice man, and so do his sons, Wally and the Beeve. <laughs> but I'm sorry, their religion is batshit. <laughs> it's like Scientology without the celebrities. <laughs> and he has every right to run for president while believing in magic underwear and believing that Jesus survived his own death and will return during an Osmonds concert in Branson. <laughs> and I have every right to take that into consideration in the voting booth. And at the end of the day, is magic underwear really that much crazier than giant arcs or virgin births or talking bushes? You're either a rationalist or you're not. And the good news is a recent poll found 20% of adults under 30 say they are rationalists and have figured out that Santa Claus and Jesus are really the same guy. <laughs> now, 20% is hardly a majority. But it's a bigger minority than blacks, Jews, homosexuals, NRA members, teachers, or seniors. And it's certainly enough to stop being shy about expressing the opinion that we're not the crazy ones. <laughs> Just because the vote is four to one, it doesn't mean the minority is wrong. People who are against this war from the start were a minority. 
The majority used to believe the world was flat, but if you believe that today, you can pack off the bell and ask to call home.